we started a study last week. Well, we've been in a study, I should say, for a while now in um, the, the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ in chronological order. And last week, we came to Mark chapter 4. We looked at really sort of that real famous parable that many people, if you know any parable, you probably know that one, the sower of the soils. And uh, we spent some time looking at that. We're not going to go through all the parables now. We'll look at a couple of them. Um, we're going to do some today, and then we'll skip, look, do some other things, and interject certain parables as they apply. But, um, and, and one of the things that, if you recall, you know, we, we've got four different soils. A lot of people call it the parable of the sower, but it's really the parable of the soils. And the soils represent, you know, four different people, four different hearts. And I have found over time, and that's one of the things I was trying to stress last week, is that in many ways, um, in many ways, these four soils, for me at least, represent my life, my growth in Jesus Christ. And, and, and where we left it last week was this, this point about how God really does call us, as he says in Hosea, to break up the fallow ground, that hard ground, to break up that fallow ground. And to, it, he says it's time to seek the Lord. And it is time to seek the Lord. It always is time to seek the Lord, but it is time to seek the Lord. In the days that we live, there's no question about that. And we're going we're gonna to kind of follow up the, you know, from that parable on today. So if you would grab your Bibles, Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to be. And um, <clears throat> if you would open them, open your Bibles or someone's Bible, and then take a stand and let's, let's read together, okay? Beginning in verse 21, Jesus says, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that which it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And he said, the kingdom of God is as, if, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown in the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the trees, oh, excuse me, so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, but without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, that you have entrusted us with your word. We thank you, Lord, for this great salvation that you've given us in Jesus, Lord that you would give everything to us, Lord, that you would have given everything to come in the form of a man, to, to be slain, to take all of the punishment that we deserve upon yourself because of how much you loved us, Lord. There, there's no greater expense that you could have ever paid, but you've done that, Lord. And, and we do come here this morning. We, we stand here, we read your word, we're, we're astounded by your word in some ways, it's very familiar to many of us. For others, it may not be, but we're all the same in one regard, Lord. We come here with things going on in our lives. <clears throat> we sing that we cry out for your hand of mercy to heal us, Lord. We, we long for your touch. We cry out, Lord, and we know that you are there, that you are the one who sustains us, that you're our rock and we cling to you. Teach us from your word, Lord. Teach us to 
having broken up and continuing to to break up this fallow ground, Lord, to to do what you desire to do in our lives, Lord, to to continue this work of, of personal renewal in each one of our lives. We don't want to be like anybody else except like you. We don't want to be like anybody else except like Jesus. And so, Lord, we stand here this morning thankful for your word. Now teach us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Have a seat, please. I really do think that the parable of the soils is, like I said, it's a great yardstick for our walk. You know, you can look at a lot of different ways, but it is a yardstick for our walk, at least for mine, because I've been through every single soil, and the third and the fourth I keep bouncing between, you know, Uh, but uh, it, it is, it's important, and we we looked at this matter last week of breaking up the fallow ground. In many ways, Jesus is now talking about how the kingdom of God advances, which is probably different than what we think. He's he's teaching about how the kingdom of God is going to advance and how it advances for for his own disciples and, and the apostles, for all who will follow. And he says, now I've just read it, but I'm going to read it again um, there in verse 21. He asks, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Isn't it set to be put on a lampstand? For there's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And I would, I'd just start by saying, be aware and thus be careful, but be aware how easy it is to quench the fire that's in us, to quench the love for Jesus that's in us, to be aware and, and beware of, of how easy it is for other things, even seemingly spiritual things, to, to get in the way and become the wrong food for our spirit and for our soul. It's important that we not quench this fire, it really is. You know, this is all about the word, right? The seed, we saw last week, the seed is the word. And we get to say the gospel, and of course that's true. But the word of God, the the, the word of God is a seed, and once planted in us, it takes takes root, it does work in our lives. And, And as familiar as the passage may be to you, or ought to be to us, you know, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, very clear description there of what the word of god is that the word of god is alive it's not just ink on a piece of paper or on your device um i never know how to how you talk about that but anyhow it's not ink on a piece of paper it's alive the word of god is alive it's powerful it's full of power and and that it's sharper than a double-edged sword and it's it's sufficient so to divide between soul and spirit and joint and marrow. And it, d- it discerns the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. I mean, that, that, that's a mind blower to me, always has been a mind blower to me, because I know that for many of us, even in here today, we probably consider the soul and the spirit very often as one and the same, and yet the, the word of God is very clear that they're not the same. So the soul is like the operating system of the body, but the spirit, we were born with a dead spirit. We were born again. Our spirit came alive when we came to Christ, right? So the word of God alone can divide between them. And, and the word of God discerns the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. He goes on to say in verse 13 that everything is naked and open before the one with whom we have to do. God knows everything about our lives. He's not saying, by the way, some people will say this sometimes, that one day it's all going to be blasted across the universe for everybody. No, God knows that. He knows all these things, and and he discerns the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts, and and he wants to speak to us, and he wants to use his word to to get there and and, and to do that work in our lives. There's so many scriptures that you'll find but you know, First Thessalonians chapter five. At the end, there, Paul lists. He just keeps listing, listing, listing. He says, you know, pray continually. Do not quench the spirit, or do not quench the spirit's fire. He says, 
Um, he says, don't despise prophesying. He says, avoid every appearance of evil. These are important things God tells us to do in, the, in terms of how we walk and how we live and in the first century and in the 21st century. This is how we're to live. And in, in Ephesians 4.30, he says there, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Think about that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What, is it, what happens when you grieve? Have you ever thought about grief? What happens when you grieve? You're, I mean, to say sad is, 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 is a cheap word, but it's, it's great sadness. So God is deeply saddened, deeply grieved when we, when we go in opposition to what his Holy Spirit in us wants us to do. So there's a, there's a way that we're to walk here. There's a way that we're to live. And, and I guess the question is, what's the word worth to you, to each one of us? That's a question I believe that each one of us has to, to ask because I know that there is a, you know, a, a real lack of reading the word of God in, in the church of Jesus Christ at large today. There's a lack of reading of the Word of God. We like, you know, Christian slogans and, and things like that, but a lack of, you know, consistent reading in, in the Word of God. And, you know, he says right here in verse 24, he says, take heed what you hear. By the way, I, I, I didn't say it last week, but um, if, if you think about this, when we were going through our Genesis study, well, we're in our Genesis study, by the way, this week um, we're going to it get booey wooey. We're going to be in chapter six, the days before the flood. So I think you'll find that interesting. Um, but but we we're in chapter three a couple of weeks ago, and what happens in chapter three? The serpent speaks to Eve, and and it finally concludes that she, it says, when she saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye, that it was that it was good for food, and to make one wise. Saw. She saw that it was good for food, saw that it was pleasing to the eye, saw that it, was, that, 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 that it would make one wise. How did she know, first of all, because based upon the serpent's authority, not upon God's authority, right? When you start to study it, and I, I don't want to say this is an absolute hard line, but it's very interesting when we are seeing, when the scripture talks about seeing, that's where we're getting into trouble. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You know, when, when we hear about hearing, faith comes by hearing the words of God. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And it's something that's repeated over and over and over again. I mean, even just this, you know, what we see. Oh, really? <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's the things that we... Pardon me, I, I was distracted. Um, <laughs> No, it's the things that we see that get in our way. It's the stuff that we see that gets in the way. It's what we hear. Now, you know, of course, this is, this is written in a day when people didn't have the, the written word in front of them, I understand. But it's, it's still an important point to, to look at. So he says, anyhow, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. Hmm, that's a really interesting kind of statement. Sounds like he's saying how we treat the word of God that has been sown in us will determine what happens with our lives. I won't ask for a show of hands. I'll just tell you about me. But I, I, you know, there are tendencies in our life as we grow in the Lord, you know, and things are happening in our lives, and we can get to a place in our lives for, you know, a thousand reasons. I, I don't know. A thousand reasons where we just sort of level up. You know, it's not this anymore. We just sort of level. We plateau. We're okay. It's good. No, it's not. Because there's no way to plateau in the spiritual life. The, uh, you can't plateau in the spiritual life. To... Uh, the, uh, to plateau is just a word that we use, but it's really like a, a, a car in neutral. It can only move one direction. We start to now move downward. And, and, and then, you know, we finally come to our senses for one reason or another, and then we, 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 we do the U-turn, and, and we start to now 
grow again. We start to invest. And God is gracious because he takes us back to those places where he's already sown in our lives. But in effect, it sounds like he's saying here, use it or lose it. He's saying, you know, uh, he's, he's investing in us. Don't waste the wisdom that God is investing in us by his word. He's investing his wisdom. He's investing his word in our heart. We're not to waste that. In other words, don't just listen to what some guy behind a box says. But what does God say to you through his word? And, and, and take that and work on that and chew on that and meditate on that and grow in that. And, and you, will, you will grow in a, in a very major way in your life. If you want to grow in the Lord, if you want to grow, if, if we want renewal, right? If we're talking about this idea of breaking up the fallow ground, it's time to seek the Lord. Really? Is it? If we're to break up the fallow ground because it's time to seek the Lord, how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of things. There's repentance of sin. There's no question about that. And it's time to come full face before him and say, here I am, I trust you, I trust you alone. There are things that are going on in my life, I don't like them, I don't like the things that are happening around me, I don't like them, but I trust you. You're my rock, I'm seeking you, I'm seeking you alone. I'm coming to your word, Lord, speak to me. He says, you have ears to hear. You know, Amos wrote, and I understand, it was written hundreds of years before Christ, but it's a, it's a verse that applies to so much of the church of Jesus Christ today. He said there's a, there's a famine coming. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the word of the Lord. I mean, there's lots of preaching going on. There are a lot of Bibles around. I mean, just in this room, I mean, if we take whatever... 300 people times the number of Bibles we have in our home, that would be pretty baffling. And, 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 and yet, the famine, he says, is the famine for hearing the word of the Lord. That's a problem. He says we're not to, we're not to allow that to happen. There, there has to be a time that we grow in him. What happens if we don't? If we're not in the word. See, the, by being in the word... You know, we, we get this expression that comes out um, of Ephesians, but, but it's useful, and that is the washing of the water of the Word. As we're in the Word of God, we're washed. He washes our heart. He washes our brains. But let me tell you, i got some pretty dirty brains that need washing. And, and you can look at me all you want, that face, because I know you do too. I'm in good company here. And, and, and or I don't know if I am in good company, but I know that we all understand that, right? But if, as we're in the Word of God, it's, there's the washing of the water of the Word. You know, I come back to this, this, this matter, Hebrews 4.12, and it has always stood out to me. As a guy, and I, you, you know a lot of my testimony, but just with all the junk of my past, just the junk, not, not just the atheism, not just the drugs and the, the immorality, the alcohol, the occult, and things like that. But with all that, what happened in the process? I didn't know what was happening. I was just enjoying myself, I thought. I was ruining myself, but I thought I was enjoying myself. And many of you, or most of you, can relate to that. And in the process, what I was doing is I was actually opening up portals into my soul. I was opening up portals. I didn't even know I had portals. I thought this was the only portal I cared about. You know, I just wanted to, to drink or to eat or, you know, what I could see. or it, That was the only portal I cared about. But there were portals in my soul. You have portals in your soul, too. And only the Word of God divides between soul and spirit and discerns the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. As we wash with the pure water of the word, he closes those portals. He seals them up again. We find healing in that place. Oh, we may need to work some things out with some people, and that's a different issue. But, but before the Lord, that's really, really very important. And if we don't, or 
for that matter, if we think we're doing it, but then we begin to go back and to open those portals again. You can find it here, easy way to remember the memory verse. 2 Peter 2.2.2. 2, 2, 2. He says, then we would be like the sow who's been washed but goes back to its wallowing, or the dog who returns to its vomit. Gross. Good way to remember it. Because, and, and, and you know what? I was there. There are times in my life I was there. God is gracious, and he says, okay, let's wash up, and let's seal those portals again. Let's move on. We have a responsibility to, to maintain the heart, to maintain the spirit, and to understand that God wants to grow his kingdom, his way, but he grows it through us. He grows it through every single one of us, no matter where you are in your life right now, no matter how you know him, how long you've known him, he wants to work through your life. And he grows his kingdom, his way, not man's way, his way. That's how he grows his kingdom. But look at this, in verse 26, he says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed in the ground he, and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself doesn't know how. But the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The farmer doesn't know how this works. The farmer just goes out and scatters the seed. As the farmer goes out and scatters the seed, God takes over. God knows what to do with, with a seed which has DNA in it and, and is going to produce a certain type of of plant from that seed, given the right conditions, sunshine, good dirt, and, and water. That's about all you need. And, and God knows how to do that. The farmer does not have to stay up at night worrying and wringing his hands, is it going to happen? We don't have to, the farmer doesn't have to go out and yell at it and hurry up, you know what you're supposed to do, come on, I sow the seed, now grow, 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 grow. No, day and night. It's active. I don't know if you ever heard about, this is a great picture of the power of, of the word of God is, some of you might remember, it's called the Methuselah seed. It was found, <coughs> excuse me, at Masada back in 2007, 10 years ago. And, and it, was, it was wheat. And they, they found a bunch of it and they took some and they put it into soil, a little bit of water, sunshine, and the right conditions, and it began to grow. It began to germinate. 2,000-year-old seed. DNA is DNA. And God designed that seed to grow. This word, more than 2,000 years old, when you, when you take it all into account, and it's still powerful. It's sharper than a double-edged sword, and it divides between soul and spirit and joint and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. And it brings us to the point where we understand, I need to know God. I need to know Jesus. I am a sinner, and I need that one who paid the price for my sin. Or I did come to Christ, and I have wandered away, but I am coming back. I think I'm okay in Christ, but I realize there's this shell around me, and that it is time to break up the fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord. That's what the Word of God does. He's faithful. The farmer doesn't, know how, doesn't have to know how it works. We don't have to know how it works. Sometimes we put so much effort into telling people what all their issues are. You know what? We would all agree for ourselves. We all know what our issues are, thank you very much. We don't really need someone to tell us. And sometimes we need someone to be a mirror and to, and to show us. We do have blind spots. There's no question about that. But God's word will do a powerful work in our lives if we, if we allow him to. It's just designed to grow. I, I really believe that it's time for the church, <coughs> the church in America, the church at Chalfon. I think it's time for the church to get radical. I, I, I don't mean silly radical, real radical. I mean, when I read through, and that's why I love, you know, in studying Genesis again on Wednesday nights, going through and looking at some of these people again, like, wow, these are radical people. When I look at Enoch, this is a radical man. 
But when, when, when I look at Noah, a radical man, or, or look at Abraham, a radical man, you can go on, Moses, and you can, can, can just move on from there through, through all these individuals, men and women, you know, but, but Daniel and David, Peter, Paul, John, I mean, you know, you, you can, and Mary, um, you know, you can, <laughs> you can, you can look at these, these are radical people. Why are they radical people? Because they're just regular people. That's all they are, is, in one sense. All they are is regular people. I'm not taking anything away from them. But they're just as regular as every single one of us in this room. But they knew God. They were in the right place at the right time. And God said, now, let's walk together. And they walked with the Lord. They were powerful in speech. And they were effective. God made them that way. They weren't born that way. God made them that way. And God used them powerfully. And God wants to, to work just as mightily, I believe, through us, through every single one of us right here in this room, as he did through them. You say, that's a little over the top, don't you think? Not a bit. I don't think that's over the top at all. Of course, why would God, the Father, who sent his Son to pay the price for our sins, not want to pour out his Holy Spirit to do this powerful work in our life. Why would he not want to do that kind of thing? It's time to break up the fallow ground. It's simple in one sense, and it's steady. The farmer doesn't know how it works. He just knows that a stalk comes up, and a leaf comes up, and then the head, and then the full, the full head, the fourth soil. Fruit is born. God wants to do that. It's time to break up the fallow ground. You know, I, I get, just got to tell you, I, uh, some of you know I have some issues. <laughs> some of you know. Yeah, he's got a lot of issues. I've, I've, heard, I've been listening to you for a while. you got issues. Not those issues. I have some physical issues. And, and some of them are from Lyme disease from a long time ago, and some of them are, you know, some, some of them are just, you know, architectural. Um, you know? <laughs> back issues and stuff like that and um some years ago now i uh i almost had surgery for the second time to correct a problem and you know i always try to make sure that i walk up here you know without limping or something like that because otherwise people and, and i appreciate it but people will say what's wrong what's going on how you doing i know a doctor i know a chiropractor you need some noni juice you need this this that. you know and there's all sorts of things that people will suggest so I try to you know, kind of hold it together, you know. And there, but people who know me will say, uh, you're not looking too good today. What's going on, you know? And um, so sometimes I'll share a little bit. And um, I don't feel like you have to come and ask me all these questions now, okay? I'm just, <laughs> I'm just telling you. But, but uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my good friend Jeff Cave um, said, don't, don't get cut. I said, look, man, I got problems. I gotta, I'm going to do Don't get cut. And it's like, it's one thing when someone says, you know, go, go see this person. But when your friend does this and he's persistent, and people think I'm persistent, but he's persistent. Um, <laughs> he said, I know this deep tissue massage therapist. You need to go see her. Great. Thank you for the number. And so I kind of waffled back and forth and finally figured, if I don't call her, I'm, you know, he's going to say, what happened? You know, he's going to find out from her. And so anyhow, so I called her. And, and I, I, I remember to this day, the, you know, the first session I had with her, brutal. It was, it was an hour long. Now they're half hour, but an hour long session. And, and as she was working on my back, she said, John, did you play a lot of sports in high school? Well, no, we didn't have a football team, you know, and I was more like a backpacker, a skier, that kind of thing. She said, those are sports, you realize that, right? I said, well, yeah, I'm just saying I wasn't like a group team kind of guy, you know. And she goes, did you fall down a lot? <laughs> That's very funny, but when someone's got their elbow in your back, and um, why? She said, this is the bumpiest road back here. You have so much scar tissue and throughout your back. I, this is going to be a while before I can work this out. Terrific. Thanks, Jeff. And, um, <laughs> but she's actually done a, a lot of, she's given me a lot of help. And 
because she's breaking up the fallow ground. That's really what she's doing. In breaking up that scar tissue, she's breaking up the fallow ground. And so then I have more range of motion. I have, the, anyhow, I'm not going to get, it's really not about me. But my point is, it's the breaking up of the fallow ground. There's something, you know, when the, when the sower sows, when the farmer sows, he doesn't know how it's going to work. He doesn't know how, how the, the seed is going to germinate. And, and he just knows that it will. He can predict that it will with the right conditions. Years ago, 1993, there was a woman that Renee and I knew who got saved. Her name is Joyce, and she's now in heaven. And, um, and, and she got saved in our family room. And then the question was, well, what do we do now? Some of you know this story. And um, it's like, um, I don't know. Uh, we'll disciple you. Okay, how do we do that? Well, I don't know. Come back here next Thursday. And so I didn't know what to use, so I just opened a Romans. Easy book. And, and so I started going through Romans and, and, you know, explaining things. She brought a friend, and then someone else heard about it, thought we were leading a Bible study, and said, not really, as we're discipling, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, this, over a matter of months, grew. It grew, and we're like, wow, how's that happen? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. And that, of course, you know, over the years, we, we went into... Um, a library on Thursday nights, and then eventually, for a couple of interesting reasons, we ended up, you know, ending up in the barn, 30 people, and then multiple services here in the, the shopping center. We don't know how. I don't even know what we're doing. Renee has always told me, don't tell them you don't know what you're doing. They're going <laughs> to figure that out easily enough. You don't have to admit it, you know. But, but we don't know. It just, it's the word. Right? It's the Word. It has to be the Word of God. But there's an interesting thing that he says here. He says then, he said, verse 30, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Controversy. Con controversy coming up. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It's like a mustard seed, which when it is sown in the ground is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown... It grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs, your Bible may say, than all the trees of the garden, and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. A mustard seed. These are mustard seeds. I, I bought them in Israel, so they must be mustard seeds. Actually, I, I tested one this morning. It tastes like Goulden, so it's mustard seed, okay? <laughs> and they're little. Actually, they look bigger because of the magnification of the glass. And, and many of us know what mustard looks like just, you know, where we live, right? But if you go to Israel, it's no different, by the way, in Israel than it is around here. The average mustard plant is not growing more than three feet, maybe four. The, the stalk is about three-eighths of an inch, maybe a half an inch. And, and the branches are as flimsy as flimsy gets. There is no self-respecting bird who's ever going to build a nest in those branches. And yet Jesus is saying this, what's he saying? Well, similar to some other passages, some other parables, I should say, he's using an opposite. Because people think the kingdom of God will look like this. The magic decoder ring for you is this. The reason we began with the sower and the soils last week is that in it, he describes the four different soils and he says that as the sower sows his seed, when it, the seed that falls on the hard ground, on the hard soil, on the path, the birds of the air come and pick it up, eat it, and fly away. It never has a chance to germinate, to take root, or anything like that. And then, later on, he explains it. Do you not understand this? In fact, he says, verse 13, he says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Oh, so it sounds like it's the Rosetta Stone, the, mo the, 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 the magic decoder ring. And he goes on to explain that Satan comes. The birds of the air are Satan, or in Matthew, I think they're called the workers of iniquity come and snatch the word. Wait a minute, because there's an interesting picture here that you actually find a number of places, no time for it this morning, but you'll find a number of places in Scripture, not just parables, where birds are often pictures 
They depict the workers of iniquity. They depict Satan at work. Now he's using the smallest seed, which any person standing there would know never grows to anything bigger than this. But he's saying it's going to become enormous, and the birds of the air are going to come and make their nests. That doesn't make sense. But he's already explained what those birds of iniquity, or what those birds represent, the workers of iniquity. We live in a day and age where we see what has happened, not just in the, the 20 and the 21st century, but for, for centuries we've seen it happen, that what people call the kingdom of God became megalith, megalithic in terms of their size and all these offices and they became melded with the government and they controlled everything that happened on planet Earth. He's saying that's not the kingdom of God. That's really what he's saying. That's not the kingdom of God. And, and there, there are all different types of forms of this that go on all the time. I, I'm the oldest guy, they call me the senior pastor. So um, I get these emails that will, will suggest you know, certain um, <clears throat> conferences that I should go to. And part of the code, you can usually break the code, figure out, it said, you know, kingdom building conference. Oh. Um, and... and uh, I always wanted to check them out, except that they're in places like San Diego or they're in Tucson or something. It's like, I can't afford to go there. And, and so I never get a chance to. But it's not worthwhile because they're, they're telling you, this is how you speak and this is, this is how you present the word and this is the kind of music you use and you never use this kind of music and, and these are the smoke machines that you buy in. And these are, and I know there's, there's good churches you smoke machines. I'm just saying, you know, there's so much theatric that has happened in the church. And keep it, keep it soft. Don't let people be confronted with the reality of their own sin. And never, ever, ever use the word sin. Don't say sin. People don't like when you say sin, especially when you, when you point and, and say, we're all sinners, right? People don't like that. Well, how do you preach Christ? If you don't, talk about sin. What's the purpose? Why, why did Jesus come? To pay the price for our sin. To pay the penalty for my sin. To defeat the power of sin. And one day to eliminate the, us, eliminate the presence of sin from us. There are so many things that, that are told us. And it's all about I guess I'd call it, they call it kingdom building. It's really empire building. It's man's empire that's being built. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't think for a minute that God isn't about numbers. God is about numbers. And it's very clear throughout the scriptures. God is absolutely about numbers more than any man, any group of men or women who are trying to build an empire. God is all about numbers. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? That's, that, that's about numbers. That's everybody. God is not desiring that any would perish, but that all, little word, means a lot. Not, God is not desiring that any would perish, but that all would come to salvation. God is very much about the numbers. Man is looking for numbers, man is looking for dollars, man is looking for power. God is looking for saved men and women. That's what he's after. That's his kingdom. And his kingdom is filling. His kingdom is filling. Sad to say, at a slower rate than hell. Because people reject the truth. Or they never hear it. But we've been entrusted, not just guys who stand behind the box, every single one of us has been entrusted with the word of God to sow the word of God, to tell people about Jesus Christ. God is looking. God is looking for willing souls who will come to him and say, I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. 
hey, you know, we can meet in a place like this, hundreds of people, it's great. But you know, back in the day, after Pentecost, you know, we see 3,000 saved at Pentecost, then another 5,000 a few days after that. And, and the scripture says, Acts chapter 2, that the believers continued steadfastly, day to day and from house to house, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and the prayer. That's church, by the way. That was church to them there. That's what church is to be. And, and it's fine to do what we do. Don't get used to it. Because there's coming a day where the privilege of doing what we're doing is going to disappear in America just like it is everywhere else on planet Earth. If you're not in a home fellowship, get in a home fellowship where you can study the apostles' doctrine and, and share in the fellowship and, and the breaking of bread, communion, and, and prayer. Pray for one another. That's church. That's God's desire. But let him break up the fallow ground and do it now. Let's stand together. So, Lord, we ask that you would do that, Lord. We, uh, we come to you. We don't have anything here to offer of ourselves except willing hearts. And we ask, Lord, that you would do that work in us. We come here, first of all, Lord, for anybody who is here today who has never, never consciously received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, today, would that person, would those people hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God loved them so much, that you sent your son to pay the price for their sin, and that if they would receive that truth, they would be born again, their sin would be forgiven, they'd be a new person, they would have the hope of heaven, they'd become absolutely renewed, the, the fullness of your spirit would be in them, Lord. That's our prayer, Lord, we pray for them. And for the rest of us here, Lord, our desire is to walk with you. Lord, break up the fallow ground in our lives. There, there are areas where we want to break it up and areas we can't see to break up but you know us fully lord and so since we're fully known by you do that work in us and lord for anybody who desires prayer to come up here lord and to and to receive prayer lord we thank you for your love for us in jesus name amen You saints of the Lord is paid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus has fled. Fear not, he is with us, so be not.
Amen. Amen. Prayer partners are up front. God bless you all.